we would have more money than ideas, I think there's something wrong. So I better have more ideas than at the end uh, the money is available for the funded. Hello, Space Watchers. This is Emma, your editor-in-chief, and this is Space Cafe Radio, the place to be if you want to know everything about the space sector. Today we are here with a very freshly baked interview because Thorsten and I had the chance and the privilege to interview Dr. Josef Ashbara, ISA's Director General, just the day after the end of the Paris Ministerial. This was a great occasion because we had the chance to ask him a couple of impressions on how it went. Just to remind you, Dr. Ashbar is bringing home a great success because he's been able to increase the ISA budget of the 17% from 2019. And this was not a result that we took for granted by any means. In a time like this, when countries have to face enormous economic distress due to the war and the increase in the energy prices, increasing the space budget of so much was challenging to say the least. So we had the chance to discuss uh, the meaning of this increase in budget with him and, of course, uh, the significance for the future of the European space industry. Listen up. Dr. Aschbacher, congratulations. First of all, it seems to be a very busy one and a half years in the preparation and a very intense two days here in Paris. But you brought it over the finish line. Sincere congrats. Your goal and the 16.9 billion show a gap. Why didn't member states are not follow your way fully when space is so important these days for all of them? Let me say two words on this uh, amount of money because this is uh, sometimes being discussed. Yes, it is true. I was proposing 18.5 billion, but it is always in ministerial conferences that these director general proposes a set of activities which add up to a certain amount. But always uh, the subscriptions are below on average uh, of this proposal. So this is normal. And uh, this is uh, not unusual, I would say, for ESA ministerial conferences. And I think this is actually good because if we would have more money than ideas, I think there's something wrong. So I better have more ideas than at the end uh, the money is available for, to fund it. But the second point, and this is really an important one, 16.9 billion is 17% more than last time. And achieving this in times of crisis with hyperinflation in many countries, with an energy crisis, with a war in front of our door is magnificent. And this is really something that I'm very happy and very grateful to the member states that they have committed fully to space. I can assure you that every single country was making the best possible effort to subscribe as much as they can, given the circumstances. And for this, I'm really grateful. And I think it's a huge success for space in Europe, for space, but also for ESA as a mechanism to bring member states together and shape future new programs. And we have a number of new exciting programs which have been subscribed, which are taking off now. That means being initiated and built. I mentioned ExoMars as an example. I mentioned EL3 or the Argonaut as another example. The Earth Observation Projects, uh, ILS2, Copernicus, Next Generation, but also within the future your envelope, uh, the new Earth Explorer, plus telecommunication, secure connectivity, of course, as a big strategic line, which was subscribed. And, and for this, I'm really grateful. And I think the result is just fantastic. Thank you very much. Among the activities which got a larger boost, there were navigations, which saw Almost a five-time increase, if I calculate it roughly correctly, something like 380% increase. Can you explain what is the strategic view behind this move and how this budget will be divided within the navigation project? Will it go only towards Galileo or other missions? Yes, navigation is one of the big winners in percentage terms, I would say, of the ministerial compared to the previous uh, ministerial. But you have also to put the numbers in context. In the last ministerial, navigation was relatively small. There was only Navis with an envelope of 100 million. And this time we had Navis per enter NAV EO, which is a new program which has sub elements. And here we had two elements called Leo, PNT, and Genesis. And both have been doing very well. Certainly, Leo PNT, and this is a strategic orientation with a, a low Earth constellation, uh, we will establish for navigation to further increase the accuracy of the signal. And this certainly will develop into a future major activity. But of course, we usually start small, and therefore the Leo PNT had a relatively small amount of money, 100 million, as, as which was subscribed. So, yes, in this perspective, the strategic orientation is to make sure that we remain at the forefront of providing the most accurate navigation signal in the world as we do it today with Galileo, but also in the future, we want to continue doing that. And yes, uh, these are strategic lines, especially future enough, which enable that. We will go into the details with all these fantastic programs over time. But for today, let's 
have a look at the numbers from yesterday. The big contributors, France, Italy, Germany, got bigger, much bigger. And the gap to the small member states is getting bigger as well. Do you feel a need to close these gaps in these three years to come? On the other side, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Norway, Canada, lords, their contribution. And how does that come? This is only partially true, if I may, because if I take the, of course, the very big countries, the three big ones, that's Germany, France and Italy, they had a good increase. I mentioned some numbers so just to put it in context. Of course, Italy had an increase of 36%, which is uh, tremendous. And this is a really fantastic success. And Italy has really outperformed itself already in 2019, having had a, a very good subscription. Germany had a 7% increase. So it was a bit uh, less in percentage terms. Uh, France had 20%. But then let me mention some medium-sized countries. And here, I think Belgium had a 28% increase. I think Switzerland had a 35% increase compared to last time. I think Spain had a 23% increase. And you see here that in this next group of countries, uh, uh, the increase was very high. Also the UK, a 14% increase compared to the previous ministerial. And then you have smaller countries, uh, Austria, 25%, Netherlands, 31%, Sweden, 31%. So you see that some of these medium, smaller countries had uh, significant increases. So, uh, of course, Estonia had a 250% increase, but there the amounts are uh, relatively moderate. There are actually uh, two exceptions, if I may. One was Romania, which, as you all know, had a very severe financial crisis also affecting the space domain. So there we didn't get an increase. And the second one was Hungary, but the Hungary had basically the same amount as before. All the other countries have increased. And this for me is a tremendous signal that they are committed to space. They believe in space. They believe in ESA. And this for me are very important signals. Another curiosity I had observing the numbers from yesterday was the matching of funding between Earth observation and human and robotic exploration. So my first question is like, again, human and robotic got a huge boost. What is the strategy behind it? And on the other side, the fact that now Earth observation and human and robotic exploration are more or less on the same level is it a signal that ESA's interest are shifting more towards the moon rather than the Earth? No, <laughs> because the human exploration uh, program has uh, human and robotic exploration. As there we are starting really exciting projects. I mentioned before ExoMars and uh, EL3, the Argonaut uh, program that means dedicated to the moon. Uh, and yes, these are new activities, but also our commitments, which we have made to NASA to make sure that our astronaut flights can continue to the ISS through the delivery of European service modules, for example. Of course, we have a commitment that uh, we made and we have to fulfill. And this, uh, of course, requires a certain level of funding. So altogether, yes, it is true. Exploration has increased significantly. And I'm very happy about that. But Earth observation and climate change remains our top priority. And there are many programs that address climate change issues. It's not only the Earth Observation Program, by the way, because in TIA, in telecom and integrated applications, you have a, a large portion of activities, especially in bus, but also some others where you improve food telecommunication, a flight route, for example, or the IRIS program or, or other ones, where you use telecom together with navigation to also look at our planet Earth. If I add up the budget allocation today in ESA of uh, Earth Observation, Telecom and Navigation, it is 51% of ESA's budget. So still, planet Earth is our focus. But yes, I also would like to develop the exploration part. So yesterday you highlighted an important step towards the EU sovereignty. Germany, France and Italy signed a joint statement about lunches. I was wondering if you can help me with the dialectic of a bureaucratic language that I was not able to understand perfectly. I was curious about a note in the statement which mentioned the need of, and I'm quoting here, starting a reflection on the conditions for the industrial and geographical distribution of work in exploitation. I'm asking this because shortly after the announcement, Minister de Le Maire restated that France has some doubts about the geo-return policy. So my question is like, what does this mean? Do you intend to look into the fair return policy and change it or do some changes towards it? What you address is really for the exploitation of the launchers. So this is not across uh, all the programs. This concerns the launcher exploitation. And in particular, the development and the elements that are required for Ariane 6 flights and uh, Vega C uh, flights in the future. And uh, yes, 
has been a discussion between the three countries because they are the main suppliers, if I may say, of components and technology for these uh, launchers. Of course, we have also other participants, just to be very correct, for medium-sized countries, Switzerland, Belgium, for example, and others. And yes, there has been a discussion, but what we will call it a fair return in the sense of once this industrial chain is established and the contracts are being awarded, and if there is a mismatch between subscriptions and contract awards, which will undergo a more competitive approach, we will adjust the payments retroactively. In other words, if a country pays 100 and the industry in that country only consumes 90, so the 10 million will then be credited or paid back. I think the mechanism we have to elaborate, but certainly that the country covers the costs that occur in that country. But this will then be a readjustment at the end uh, after the competitive process, which is different from the other process where we have uh, in advance uh, subscriptions and then we run the competition and you can have over or uh, under subscription. So this is a reflection of the three member states, I should say, but where they ask us to reflect on this and see how this could work, but to readjust the, the contributions uh, um, once the contracts are being awarded. The effect of this would be, and this is what the three countries tell us, and you have been quoting the interview of Mr. Le Maire, is, um, the idea is to, through this process, enhance competition and therefore reduce costs. The remaining 1,095 day to the next ESA ministerial in Berlin then will be a rough ride, economically, geopolitically and environmental. Where do you see your personal challenges in ESA, with ESA? Yes, the preparation of the ministerial 2025 starts today. So we had a very successful event yesterday and already I've already had a reflection with my team to see what have we learned from this and how do we move forward and what are the changes in terms of, of approach and strategy that we might apply. In terms of big picture, it is clear that the ambition which I have kicked off through the Agenda 2025 will continue and I will certainly set very high targets for Europe in space for 2025. What this exactly is, which number we have to, of course, develop, uh, which projects are being the flagship programs and activities we will develop over the next years. But certainly, I would like to continue this path of growth for space in Europe, as we have seen it through yesterday's ministerial conference. As you know, we got 17% more as compared to last time. And that is a very nice, significant increase, especially given the circumstances. And I would like to continue on this growth path because I'm firmly convinced that Europe has the excellence, Europe needs space in daily life, and we need to really play an active role in order to really shape and uh, co-lead some of the activities. And you see this written very clearly in all the strategy documents which we publish and all the statements which we make. So this will continue. Now, if you go one level further down on which of the domains are being more developed and which are maybe less developed, I certainly would like to continue increasing all the domains. This is obvious. Climate change will remain our top priority and we will focus in the next years our activities on tackling the problems on our planet Earth and there will be many activities that we will initiate and prepare for the next ministerial. So this is always the number one priority. I will also work on human exploration. I think this is something where we need to build up a stronger presence of Europe. If I remind everyone that the budget in exploration of Europe is about 7% of that of NASA, then you see the order of magnitude. Uh, of course, we will never reach the levels of NASA. This is obvious. But certainly, I would like to have a strong European capability also to be a strong partner internationally with NASA and other partners. And this is something I really would like to build up. I see we are planning for a space summit next year in Spain. It was announced yesterday to be in Sevilla in November, together with the German co-presidency of ESA and the Spanish EU presidency. And I really want to prepare this summit very well. And human and robotic exploration will be key topics for that summit. I would like to hear something more concrete from you. What will we have seen in the next three years to come? So an Ariane 6 maiden flight, I hope, Artemis 2, 3, humans on the moon. So what are the highlights you envision for ESA? Okay, first of all, we will have a number of launches which planned. Uh, of course, they have all been, the satellites have been developed over the last 10 years or so. Next year will be quite exciting for space science. So we have Euclid and uh, JUICE that are on the launch manifest. We have Sentinel. 1C being launched in spring next year to replace Sentinel-1B, which had an in-orbit failure. And then we will launch the C units of other Sentinel in order to really ensure guaranteed uh, data from the Sentinel family for many, many applications down on Earth. We also 
certainly will see the Artemis uh, 2 flight with first time astronauts on board, not the European one, unfortunately, but with astronauts on board. And that, of course, then sets the base for the next flights, Artemis 3 with an astronauts uh, on the moon, uh, and then uh, Artemis 4, 5, and so on, where European astronauts are already planned to be participating, especially with Artemis 4 and Artemis 5, because they are also establishing and building up the gateway with European contributions, IHAP and Esprit in particular. So yes, there will certainly be a plan of uh, future flights to, uh, to the gateway and eventually to the moon. I will, in fact, fly to Washington next week to present the results of the ministerial to NASA and start a dialogue on uh, what this means in terms of our NASA ESA cooperation for the years to come. And this is not only Artemis, this is really the whole exploration package of uh, Mars, Moon, ISS, uh, future, but also Earth observation. And this will be quite uh, an important meeting for me personally to present these very successful results and see how we move from there and what our next concrete steps will be. Thank you very much for your time. And we hope that you have a well-deserved weekend and can get some rest. Together. Thank you very Thank much. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And if you want to stay on the pulse of the space industry, please visit our website at www.spacewatch.global and subscribe to our newsletters. And of course, don't forget to become a Space Watcher. I'm Thorsten Greening, publisher at spacewatch.global, your independent perspective on space. <laughs>